All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Identity Implementers Working Group call for July 28th, 2022. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Shar Holland, and I'm a co-moderator of this group with Tim Spring. Uh, today, we will go over working group status updates and then hear a presentation from Marco Luti, the lead product designer at Procivus, um, on designing an SSI wa wallet. So as usual, since this is a Hyperledger Foundation call, we're following the antitrust policy. And since this is a Hyperledger call, we're following the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, which are both uh, linked here. Um, this call is being recorded and will be posted on the meeting page later today. Um, introductions, would anybody like to introduce themselves if you're new or rejoining the call and would like to say hi? Um, or a few words about wh why you're involved in this space. Hi, Shar. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Marco, uh, and I'll be presenting. Yeah, perspectives of designing a SSI wallet app later on. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us, Marco. We really appreciate it. All right, and then I will send out the link to this wiki. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and put your name under the attendees list, um, that would be great. Let's see. A few announcements worth mentioning. There is an Aries Interopathon proposed for August 31st. Um, I'm sure we can get more definitive details as that date draws nearer. Um, and then also two relevant conferences, the Hyperledger Global Forum, um, in Dublin in September, and then rebooting Web of Trust um, in Den Haag in September as well. And there are links if you'd like to learn more. Are there any announcements anybody else has that uh, they'd like to share? All right. Then I think we are ready to go ahead and um, go through working group updates. Let's see, so the start with Hyperledger, um, the main identity working group um, have, haven't met since we last met, and then the Indie Contributors working group there, they're active of course, but have had um, their last couple of meetings canceled uh, because of holidays. So not too much to report there. Uh, the Aries working group, is anybody involved in this one who'd like to report? So in the Aries Working Group, they've been um, discussing credential extras, specifically adding the fields um, issuer credentials, hash link data, and attached. This is an, an alternative to using the generic extra structure instead of a structure for each purpose. But I think they've settled on calling them supplements instead of extras. Um, so there's more information on that if you'd like to learn more. Um, Aries Bifold, they've been talking about React hooks um, 030, uh, tab, config, tab navigation configuration and ledger proxy UI discussion. Uh, let's see, Acapug. Um, this meeting uh, discussed recent merges. There was also a discussion about ledger agnostic dids and anon creds objects, um, referencing anon creds objects on other ver verifiable data registries. Um, so there's a desire to support did indie so that we can have multiple ledgers easily on a single agent without checking all the ledgers. Let's see, Aries Framework Go. We've got some work updates there. There are links to these um, PRs if you'd like to learn more. Um, Aries Framework JavaScript. Let's see, they've been talking about uh, um, AFJ and Aries uh, Fabric Integration and mod Modularization API. I can uh, I can uh, say a few words on that if you like. Please, thank um, you. Yeah, the, um, the the AFJ Aries Fabric Integration, we, we had a demo at our weekly meeting last uh, Thursday, I think it was, from a company called Crubben. I don't know if you pronounce that, C-R-U-B-N, Crubben revolutionizing 
governance through blockchain is their is their motto and they and their, their guys have been building this uh aries fabric uh layer so the idea there is that you would use the afj either to kind of um plug in an indie blockchain or a fabric blockchain um it's very very cool the demo was fantastic i was very impressed with it and, and it's, it's great what they're doing it's a very early stages yet and kind of my worry is that kind of you know kind of duplicating all of the masses of sort of indie uh identity layer stuff in fabric is is a big task but they they're taking it on and they've they, 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 they got, they're, they're making very good progress so um just just the last point on that is kind of well why would you want to do that and this is a particular um interesting topic for me because i spent a couple of years working with fabric and i've spent the last two or three years working with Ari, so i kind of have a, a, a take on both sides of the equation and um what this could enable use cases is if you imagine that the sort of enterprise blockchain fabric type thing where you have you know all of these like big huge supply chain things and all the rest of it that things like fabric are really good at but it doesn't have a very good identity layer because the fabric identity layer is this certificate authority server with x509 and all the rest of it and then on the other side you have indie which is great for identity um and it's built for that but it doesn't have smart contracts and tokens and we can't do all the kind of sort of enterprise scale blockchain kind of stuff that fabric can so how about we come up last year where we merge all of that cool functionality into one thing uh so for example i i, I always had this dream of building a supply chain sort of enterprise network where each stage of the supply chain where you needed identity you could go off to a, a verifiable credentials network and say hey give me your uh export license or your, your VAT certificate or whatever it would be. And we'd use verifiable credentials for that. And in the past, you would need to build Fabric and Hindi sort of alongside each other, yeah, two blockchains, uh, not, not, not a great solution. So what these guys have done is kind of basically solve that problem or, or on the way to solving it, whereby you could have all of the enterprise blockchain solutions provided by Hyperledger Fabric with a really cool Aries Hindi type identity Aries, not in the Aries identity layer kind of built into that as well. And they're making really good progress. Very, very cool stuff. So um, just wanted to say a word for these guys because uh, I said very impressed with that. So yeah, that's what we saw last week. Great. Thank you so much for, for jumping in with that, Mike. I, I'm glad the demo went so well and um, appreciate your, your explanation of that. Thank you. No worries. All right. Looks like uh, we're at the end of the Hyperledger working groups that we track. Um, Hyperledger Ursa um, has not been meeting recently. Um, are there any other Hyperledger updates that anybody wants to give? All right, I think we can move on to Trust Over IP. Um, they had their all members meeting um, on July 20th. Um, did anybody attend this one who'd like to report? All right, looks like they talked about upcoming conferences, some new task forces, including um, artificial intelligence and the metaverse task force, governance architecture task force, mental models task force, and then also discussed uh, working on a white paper on biological ecosystems. Let's see, the steering committee met on July 13th, um, which was reported on in our last meeting. Um, let's see. The communications committee. Um, anybody involved in this one who'd like to report? We're meeting tomorrow, that's best I got. Okay, great. And we'll would love to hear about that in our next meeting. I don't know if Dan or anybody else from TYP could comment on CBS Health joining. I'm, I wasn't aware that they were a steering committee member now. So, Yeah, yeah, they definitely joined. Um, I can't remember who is represented, uh, who is represented on the call. We have to look in, in the meeting minutes, but yep, um, they, uh, they joined and yep, they're a steering uh, a member now, yep. Yeah, that's fantastic. They're supporting um, um, uh, participation in Didymium as well. Um, I and I understood that the 
they may not have been committing to the TYP direction. So that's great to hear. Thanks, Dan. That's great. Thanks for that update. All right, uh, governance stack working group. Anybody involved in this one who'd like to report? Yeah, I can say something to that. Um, I am actually on that governance architecture task force. There's a, a small number of us. Um, and we, we're, we're kind of taking it slow through the summer here, um, but uh, we do anticipate uh, kind of changing the uh, structure of the governance documentation. And really, uh, in a nutshell, it is going to be um, more component-based governance than layer-based governance. Um, the original intention was that it would be layer-based based on the four layers of trust over IP, um, but we're going to be switching that around and doing it more component-based. So for example, you could have a governance uh, framework that talks about just a schema and credential um, versus the entire layer three um, kind of piece. So. Great, thank you for that update. Yeah. And it looks like the governance stock working group will take a brief break for the summer and uh, return in early September. That's right. Cool. All right, technology stack working group, anybody? Like to report on this one? Uh, yeah, tech stack, uh, tech art task force. We're um, yeah busy on uh, on writing the technical specification, uh, shooting for the end of August to uh, uh, to complete that. Um, at the um, well, coincident with the Hyperledger Global Forum is. Um, uh, the open, uh, what is it, open source uh, meeting and Trust Over IP is going to have a, a mini conference there and um, Drummond will present, um, Drummond and maybe a, a Wenjing, I think, are going to present the uh, the output of the Tech Arc Task Force, the, um, uh, yeah, uh, that, um, that uh, tech spec, um, at least the initial draft of it. So that's uh, that's what I know. Great, great. That's Dan, are you planning to go? Are you planning to go to that Hyperledger Global Forum, the Mini Summit, and all that? I, I personally am not, um, because there's uh, my main area is still biometrics, and there's a European Association of Biometrics meeting uh, that conflicts with it. So I, I, ah. I'm planning to go there. Okay. Great, thank you for that update. All right, Utility Foundry Group. Let's see, anyone involved in this one who'd like to report? So they haven't met since June, as far as I can tell, but they um, reported in the all members meeting that their ongoing work items are the public utility directory. Um, this is a list of all the active layer one utilities. Um, and then a framework for evaluating layer one utilities, um, which is in the final review stages. And then um, in the future, they'll be focusing on combining efforts with the layer one governance task force, um, and then have a specific de deliverable on decentralized identity architecture and regulatory compliance. Um, so that's what they are focusing on. Uh, Ecosystem Foundry Group, anybody involved in this one who'd like to report? They had a presentation from um, Kirthi Thomas on drone pilot credentialing for air safety in their last meeting. And then concepts and terminology. Anybody want to report on this one? Looks like they are continuing their work on the terminology toolbox framework. Um, their, their new work is that they now have a volunteer development team and an architect for Terminology Toolbox 2.0. They're, they're also working on mental models to explain, um, to, to create a mini ontology and 
Um, and this is the group that is planning to start up that uh, mental models task force um, in September. So great. Any other TOIP updates? All right. Next up is the diff. Um, anybody involved in the DIDCOM working group would like to report? They've been discussing um, having a blog post for the diff blog. Um, there's a draft linked there. And then DIDCOM users group, uh, as far as I can tell, I don't believe they've met um, uh, since we last met. If anyone knows otherwise, feel free to jump in. Uh, and same with the interoperability group. All right, uh, Sovereign Foundation. Um, let's see. I think as far as I can tell, again, um, their last meetings were in early February. Um, is anybody aware of work going on um, in either of these groups or in the SSI and IoT working group? Sure, I'm a member of the SSI and IoT working group. And um, I think we'll keep the name the same for the time being. We haven't, I haven't really talked about it with Michael, but um, I think we're on the cusp of getting into some really, really cool stuff, especially the um, uh, the, the relationship between SSI, zero trust, IoT and edge devices and digital twins. And um, we've got a number of presentations and discussions um, regarding digital twins and the, con the components of, of IoT into that and modeling and on SSI and on uh, zero trust. Um, and on a separate but related note, we've affiliated with the Digital Twin Consortium and their security and trustworthiness working group. And there are parallels between some of the areas we're going. So to watch this space, I think we've got some exciting stuff coming. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad we're reporting on this group and keeping up with it and appreciate that update. All right. The W3C standard um, in the DID working group, um, I'm not aware of them meeting recently. Um, if anybody knows otherwise, feel free to jump in. And the... But the big news there is, oh yeah, you have it. Uh, wait, do you have it there that it was adopted, the initial version? Oh, yes. Yeah. That was the big news out of that, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, because the, the big three were pushing back on that, but um, either they relented or were convinced, but bottom line, it, it passed the uh, 1.0. Drummond was very happy. They're, they're already working on the next version, but Drummond said he's, he's done. But uh, <laughs> he, he spent a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, sweat equity in getting that over the hump, and he, there was much rejoicing, and uh, he's moved on. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, thank you for, for emphasizing that. All right, in the community credentials group, um, they met recently, they had a meeting on um, verifiable credentials for education task force. Um, links there if you'd like to learn more. All right, are there any other working groups um, or updates that I'm missing for the um, W3C standard group or the, or any, any any foundations in general? All right, in that case, I will hand it over to Marco for his um, presentation. I'll uh, pass the screen share over to you and um, I think you should have access to screen sharing, but yeah, thank you again so much for, for being here, Marco. Thank you all. I'm uh, really excited <laughs> to present. Um, so yeah, <laughs> let us begin. So I, I will be talking about designing uh, designing the SSI wallet, like perspectives from a designer. So uh, 
what we've noticed at Preserve is when we talk about the whole SSI space, it's always very technical or conceptual, but we, uh, we always forget the details of the, 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 the human interaction. So we thought it'd be interesting to show how we approached those challenges with our uh, current products and ideas that we've played around in our current product. Uh, a little bit about Procevis. Uh, we're a Swiss company founded in 2016, and uh, we want to unlock the potential of uh, the digital in the public se sector. So for us, it was always in the center that uh, EID should be the core base of, of it all, but we also knew that there were principles that we wanted to follow, like we thought a mobile first, we think a mobile first solution is the, the, the correct way to approach it, always keeping the user in the center, and of course, decentralized data management and data protection with the highest securities. Um, a little overview of our products. Uh, we started out with the EID Plus product, which is like a smart government solution where you can uh, order uh, re debt registry extracts and uh, you have a verified EID on it. This is currently running in Switzerland in two cantons. Cantons are comparable to states. Uh, MDL, which is our uh, driving license, digital uh, mobile driving license solution. We started that in 2020 and uh, uh, we are in the process of, of getting it ISO certified. Uh, and since last year, the topic we're talking about today, SSI Plus, we've, uh, we, we, we started working with the the hybrid uh, ledger in the and Aries frameworks and uh, yeah, it's the product I'm going to be talking about today. Starting point before we get into the product and designs. Uh, in our whole process, we, we we decided we should have some like guidelines, some mantras to follow, and uh, we we when we kicked it off, we were like, all right, how would we explain this to our partner or to our parents what we're trying to do? And uh, we always have the symbol, we're like we're trying to take what you have in your wallet and make it digitally accessible, usable as you use it in the physical world and as uh, trusted and secure as we have it now. So a goal for us was at minimum, it should be as easy to use as you use your normal ID, uh, physical ID card. It should be as trusted as your driver's license when you show it to the police officer. And uh, yeah, we followed that. The next question, of course, is how do you even proceed to achieve such a goal? So we reflected it back and we looked what Apple did with the touch paradigm uh, over 15 years ago uh, with the, you know, there has to be a transition. So we call it a evolution instead of a revolution. We're not trying to break this whole world that we have. We're trying to transition the physical to the, to the digital. And uh, the way Apple did it was by using these metaphors or scoiomorphic design and slowly easing the user in. So a notebook looked like a physical notebook. Nowadays, it's, it's an abstract uh, form of it. Or uh, when you had a, the, the, the iBooks app, it was a, a bookshelf with the books physically placed there. So it was this transfer of, you know, you look at the driver's license, it has all these elements of this, this haptics, this touch uh, that makes it trustworthy. We, we said it's important to transition this over. And the other thing we also observe what's happening right now, the physical, uh, the digital space is, in, uh, is affecting the physical space. So uh, MasterCard has announced, I think last year that they want to uh, issue their credit cards in a portrait mode. And this development of course happens because we we live on a cell phone now, we consume videos in portrait mode. I mean, some people still roll their eyes, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a reality. So all these formats are, are, are morphing into that. Um, so with, with those goals in mind, we, we, we started our product and I'm, I'm gonna jump to the end. So, we're going to see a demo video from uh, about, about six weeks ago um, where it shows our video. So important to note about our product, we're focusing very much on the Swiss government. We, the Swiss government is planning to, to bring out uh, an SSI solution. They're working on the law. 
So the, for example, here we see the onboarding. The onboarding is a mandatory onboarding where we are issuing a base ID based on the on your physical Swiss identity card. And this is just a, a demonstration. It's not really, it's just to a proof of concept to show what would be possible. We also have different onboardings for different cases, such as a manual onboarding or directly from the QR code. But yeah. So in this case, this uh, user set up their uh, identity card and got a, a VC, a verifiable credential. And in the next case, we're showing another issuance of a, a VC through our desk. And this is a Swiss driver's license. Yeah, and then in the final step, we're playing through like, how can we uh, do a proof request? In this case, we're doing a rental car demo where we're using that driver's license that we issued before to yeah, verify that we're able to drive that category, that we still have a valid driver's license. Yeah, so how did we get to this point? Uh, <clears throat> Of course, I, I wait, waited for the logos. <laughs> um, so how do we get to this point? We, uh, so we, we, we tried to keep the wallet as simple as basic. So we have a top down uh, semantic layout where we're like trying to structure the different sections. We start out by being personal and saying, hey, welcome to your uh, wallet. Uh, here's the credential. Um, and then the navigation, how we see it. So you see how these credentials are moving the shared with are the connections associated with this credential. So we, we were trying to, through, through testing, we realized that the, the user gets very confused between their credential library and their connection library. So we, we, we quite quickly got to that point and we did this by, oh, I'll skip this part. We did this by uh, uh, continuously testing ideas. So we, 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 we would always create these rapid click dummies the, the first version, of course, based on our uh, on our uh, EID, we realized the EID context, our setup was not the best. Then we, in December, played around with the shared with and the history with the, the user acceptance was higher, but quickly realized this history part is not, is very confusing. You have to double tap and then move to this current version where we have a favorites and an old tap. So the favorites is an overall view. And yeah, we were we were testing with users. Uh, first test we did was uh, for a tender with Luxembourg. The Luxembourg is looking for a, we uh, was experimenting with the concepts of SSI. They wanted the verifiable credentials and we got to build a, a little platform, demo platform, which they uh, yeah got to see, which I'm not gonna show today. Um, I said, there's a lot of things to show in this app. So maybe to break it down, we go over the highlights that might be interesting for, for, for Hyperledger, you know, perspectives that we had to implement because uh, we need it. So uh, I, I always like to start this part by saying, what, what, what keeps me up, up uh, at night as a designer or what kept me up at, as, a, as a designer? So the first question that I always ask myself was how do we share credentials? I mean. How do we share different versions? How we do, do we share if it's a zero knowledge proof? I mean, there are a lot of incredible complexities. And I mean, if I explain zero knowledge proof to my parents, they'll look at me and be like, excuse me, what? So we're, we're, those were, was one of the challenges. Uh, in Switzerland, we have four uh, national languages. I mean, we're, we're a small country. We have that many languages and it's always an issue. So how do we handle language? Do we show all the languages, how they do it now uh, on the identity card, or do we, because we're in the digital space, uh, change the language by seeing what the, 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 the user prefers. Um, then uh, the next question was always, I mean, 
all these institutes and entities, they, they're, they're proud of their current credentials and they, they want to have their designs. They want to see their designs in that. So we're like, okay, we have to figure out a way to solve this. This, this is important to them. It's, it's a bit of a prestige story. And then the, the other question, because we are also interoperable, how do we handle external credentials that do not have a design file and yeah, make them look good and as good as the other credentials? So simply sharing. Um, oh, that did not work. Oh, sorry. So it's not working the way I want it to. Uh, in the sharing flow here, we have an example of someone's uh, scanning a proof request and we're asking for these credentials. So it's easy. We can see there's a lock on all the check marks. So it indicates that they're all required and you can either cancel or share. And can I ask um, when you shared those credentials, were you using, yeah, what, what protocol were you using? How did you securely and privately share those credentials? Uh, <laughs> so as to mention again, I'm the designer. It would have been great if we had uh, one of our developers here, uh, our lead architect. Uh, as, okay, as fair as enough. Uh, that, uh, Dan, but, this looks to me like it's uh, Indie Aries. Um, it's Indie. Indie. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah. Just, yeah. The whole product is uh, Indie Aries, that, that far I know, yeah. Okay, so it's probably using a non-creds or something like that. Yeah, okay. And um, yeah. Com, yep. Yeah. Uh, in the next version, uh, I'll go through how we do handle multiple versions. So in this use case, let's say I get a, my role changes from lead uh, product designer to head of design uh, and they don't revoke my last credential. How do we ha handle that when we, when we do, uh, go to the sharing flow? So here we have a selector which indicates, hey, there are multiple versions. We default by always selecting the last issue. So you can then say, no, I want the, 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 the oldest one and switch and share that with the verifier. And the last one, which we're still working on is the zero knowledge proof. So we're, we're still working out the details, especially the language part, but we've noticed that from the very beginning, we have to somehow communicate that we're only a uh, uh, transmitting the condition without calling it zero knowledge proof. So this is one of our current experiments on how to resolve this. We, we're doing an age check of a driver's license to see if the person's 18. And as you can see right now, we're doing this conversion of, is this date of birth uh, older than uh, the, 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 the 18 year old limit to tra uh, translated into a date. So, because the date was, I think the 25th of uh, July. Uh, so 25th July of 2005 or four, no, 2004. Yeah, still working on that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, then the language thing. So on the, the app side, we, uh, <clears throat> You, you, you can uh, switch uh, between two languages currently. We're trying to get more languages on board over time. Uh, that's all good and all, you know, the, the close button there is now Schließen, which is German, uh, but how do we handle the attributes? So uh, we, we, we can't really handle the, 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 the values of the attributes, but what we did is in our desk, we, uh, we enabled, uh, <clears throat> Uh, to 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 uh, document different languages. So here we have English and German. English set as a primary, so it always will default to English. And then we can add uh, the, the attributes we want. We also have attribute types, which is like: do we have a type date? Do we have a type uh, email address? Gender. So we have these standard types that we've we've seen reoccurring in uh, other VCs and. Yeah, uh, we can put the translation in there. So there's no real point of translating the title of the credential much because it's the same in both languages. But for example, given names is Vornam and uh, date of birth is uh, Geburtsdatum. And that's how we 
can swap the attributes within the app, the labels of the attributes, of course. And then uh, designing for VCs, uh, which is the next step after the translations. So now you, you've set your schema up and you're, you're, you're like, you need to focus about the design. We, we start by defining the credential types and we made it really simple because, I mean, how do the, the entities do it now? They, they send their print files to the, to the uh, printer and they, they, they get done. Well, our hope is maybe in the future to make it more par parameterized so we can have responsive design but this is for a V1, our way of solving it. And of course you can design how it looks. So we have the, the dashboard review, which is the wallet view. So it's when it's min minimized only with two attributes in the main, you can combine the name. You can say here it is an image or not an image. You can also change the order of, of how it's displayed in the, the detail view. And then next step, you can publish. And yeah, how do we handle external credentials? Uh, in this video, I'm going to show how we uh, get credentials issued by the Lizzy wall, uh, Lizzy demo site. Um, there, basically, what we're doing is we're we're we made a very simple generative uh, design a template. So it takes the first letter of the credential, puts it in a pattern, defines a color based on. A, ratio and as you can see it issues the base id like that has no language translation so we would switch to german right now there i think only issued on and issuer can be translated the rest will remain the way they, they were assigned and as you can see we can use this base id in the next step of the demo page and uh yeah share it Yeah, who knows where the highlights uh, sum up. Quick summary, next steps. Uh, the next couple of months are gonna be very busy for us. We're validating our eyes with different groups from the mobility and education sectors, as well commercial ideas. Uh, validate and most likely reiterate. Yeah, we'll see what the inputs are. Um, as mentioned before, expand and op optimize how we design VCs. We, we see there's a huge potential that still needs the, the, the polish that we're looking for, but we, we, we have a good foundation. And uh, another step that we also really wanna take is how, how do we do these verifications? So we're gonna focus on the usability for developers and that's gonna be documentation, how we set up these schemas. So I'm gonna work very closely with developers and figure out the needs and wants and how, how would they prefer to work with such a tool. <laughs> I also noted some hopes for the future of Hyperledger. I, um, the multi-language support, I think it'd be brilliant if there was a standard for that. And also if there was a standard for designs, I mean, I think every wall that looks different and every we Credential looks different. I know it's just a, a, a collection of attributes, but I think design is gonna be very important for the acceptance for the general public. And yeah, more growth and stability. I mean, what we've seen personally, it's been getting, it feels like it's getting stabler and stabler and uh, as time goes by and we're really excited what the future brings. Yeah, that was a, quick overview <laughs> uh, presentation on, and perspective from a designer. Questions? <laughs> Hi, Marco, it's uh, Kyle. Um, I'm working with the um, province of British Columbia and um, um, not my specific project, but um, we're working alongside a group um, who's working on a mobile wallet. They're using Aries Bifold um, in Canada, um, as well as other provinces in Canada are also using Aries Bifold. Um, one of the things that um, our team is uh, also looking at is the multi-language, uh, because in Canada, we have two official languages, English and French. Um, and <clears throat> one of the paths that we are going down for solving that problem, as well as, you know, sort of the issue of making things look nice 
is um, in the Aries world is looking at the overlay. Um, it's colloquially called uh, OCA, um, but it's an overlay OCA, ar OCA overlay architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the idea there is that it allows for things to look pretty and to do translations, but in an interoperable way. Um, I, oh, that's, yeah. That's cool, wow. So I can connect you with, um, yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Um, so I can connect you with uh, Stephen Curran or, you know, some others who are working through that. Um, but I, I would recommend and, and maybe others would recommend the same. Jim, do you have a, a further comment on? Uh, yeah, Kyle, options? thanks very much. I mean, Paul yeah. Knowles is uh, yeah, arguably the inventor for OCA. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you've probably seen, we're, they're going to restructure um, one of the working groups around what well, they end up calling it data specifications or something like that. But, but uh, Marco, what it really implies is the ability to provide granular consent of information exchange in conjunction with your, with your zero knowledge proof and your, your credential exchange. Not to say it isn't, I mean, it's technically pretty sophisticated um, and there's lots of things to sort through, but it's, it's gaining momentum and, um, yeah, yeah, I think it would be a great idea to be involved there. So. That, that, that'd be pretty cool. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Gladly look, look into it. Uh, I think you mentioned this and I uh, might've might have missed it, but did you say that it will soon be mandatory in Switzerland to have the driver's license credential? So, <laughs> so because Switzerland has a direct democracy, uh, democracy it take, everything takes very long. So right now they're trying to get the, the, the template of the law shaped. So I think it's planned to have the driver's license, but there's no specifics yet. Yeah, until the law has been passed. Ah, I see. Marco, I'm very sorry for missing this. Did you say y'all were adopting the ISO 1813 mobile driver's license formats or it's gonna be in VCs? It's going to, so, so uh, our MDL solution is based on that ISO, yes, the, the MDL ISO. Oh, thank you, appreciate it. So we also have a blog post on that, com com uh, comparing the SSI and the MDL worlds, and uh, yeah, I recommend reading it. And <laughs> yeah, where could we find the blog post that you mentioned? Uh, I'm copying it right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Oh, interesting. We did one from a, a NOTBA, if I could find it real quickly. Uh, we did a blog post as well on, uh, yeah, on, on those differences, let's say. Mm -hmm. And not the. Uh, Oh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, the MDL spec is great because the, um, uh, you know, it, it is, well, it's multiple ISO specifications. Everybody uh, refers to um, the application, but there's, um, I think, six parts to that, that specification. Um, but anyhow, but, you know, for example, out of scope is zero knowledge proofs. The way that you do zero knowledge proofs in MDL is you have basically have to hard code them. Uh, they they say out of scope is how does an issuer get an MDL into a uh, a wallet? Well, that's out of scope. They refer to a uh, uh, another um, ISO specification which is not published yet. Um, mm -hmm. So anyhow, there's interesting bits like that, but but it is an ISO spec, so there's that. Whoops. I, I sent it, sorry, a direct message, but let me send it to everyone. Um, that was the blog entry. Um, yeah, so we got to respect the fact that they, they spent years getting, getting it to be uh, an ISO specification. But um, yeah, there's, there's um, evolution in both the SSI world and MDL world, I'm sure. Definitely, definitely. Okay, may I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay, so um, self-sovereign identity is not, and should never be 
regarded as something that is exclusively blockchain. Okay, there are other ways of doing self-sovereign identity. For example, the European Union's Green Pass for coronavirus uh, COVID certificates was based on X509 PKI technology, mm -hmm. the old standard, you know, technology that's been around for, for a long for a long while. So my question to you would be, why did you decide to base your technology on blockchain and not use that same technology that was used by the EU for its green past, i.e. X509? What is it that blockchain brings to you that that doesn't? So I think with this project, we were we were really interested in using Hyperledger Indy. So it was like a test, a chance for us to test it out, a test bed. But we do realize that a PKI solution is still possible, especially in Switzerland. If we there, there, there's a GitHub channel where these discussions come up, and it seems very likely that the Swiss government would follow a a, a hybrid model where they start out with the PKI and then transition over to a blockchain model in their trust network. Okay, interesting. Uh, by the way, which you said there were two cantons. Which two cantons are using this? So, so uh, 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 the first canton is Schaffhausen. The cities, so I think currently we, are, we have over half the cities in that canton, which is Zug. E Zug is the app which is uh, which was launched by the city of Zug. Okay, the reason I ask is because I lived in Switzerland for uh, four years and I was I was actually lived in Zug for a while, so uh, it's interesting that you're talking oh, okay. about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Zug, of course, is um, a bit of a hotbed of blockchain technology. I've got, got a feeling that's where, isn't that where uh, some of the Ethereum guys are? Um, the Ethereum Foundation, yeah. uh, Stellar, all, many blockchain uh, <laughs> foundations are there. <laughs> yeah, interesting, okay. Thank you for that answer. And, and if I, um, yeah, so if if I could jump in, I think it's an interesting question, Mike. Uh, uh, and I, you know, uh, it, it's just a, a technology to me, but but it's an interesting question. Like I, you know, do a lot in border management with, uh, uh, you know, uh, passports and ICAO's uh, public key directory, um, and a reason to to have a decentralized distributed. Uh, uh, public key directory is, you know, for example, the ICAO's uh, PKD is you have two physical instances of it. Now, how is, and they're both in South Asia. How resilient is that, right? Um, do you want a, a more resilient uh, network that's uh, uh, more, more expansive, more decentralized? I mean, those are some of the reasons to go to distributed ledger, but I'm not saying one is better than the other, but, um, you know, those are some of the considerations as a, uh, architect we look at you know. listen listen dan you don't need to convince me i was playing devil's advocate there right um the, the problem is that my worry about this is a, this is a much wider issue and we're going a little bit out of scope here much wider issue than than marco's product uh i for the whole of uh, us in hyperledger aries uh and indy the, the the question is you could convince me as an architect and a technical person that yes, of course I understand that the, the decentralized uh, sort of blockchain idea of, of cutting out that middleman of certificate authority and all that gets great. Of course it's better, but we've got to sell this product out into the wider world to people who don't understand any of this. And I've always kind of thought, is blockchain technology and high pleasure areas in India and the decentralized approach so much better than X509 PKR that it's actually going to be able to sort of blow that away and, and take over and Marco was talking about the Swiss government are going to move towards that. And I would be very, very interesting to hear the reasons why they were going to do that, because I worry that our technology is so much better than what's already there that it will actually take off and move beyond anything other than just being a niche. So, Dan, yeah. you know, I'm on your side on this one. That, that's always been my concern, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, in Europe, um, you know, they're legislating their European digital identity wallet and they've already established EBSI and ESIF and you know, and mm -hmm. I've asked them, like, would they have two different blockchains in Ethereum based, what, Besu and, and Fabric? I'm like, why didn't you decide to use the, the one Hyperledger um, uh, project that was purpose built for identity? If you're doing identity, why didn't you use Indy? And well, you know, Actually, we yes. consider it, you know. Yeah. But yeah. anyhow, so EBSI and ESIF, um, 
uh, are using blockchain, but Fabric and, and Besu. Yeah, hence why so, earlier on I was talking about the fact that there are people who are building the sort of Indie SDK type thing into the into the Fabric and building a proper identity layer, which as I mentioned, what's going on in AFJs for me. So it's really, really cool because you get the best of both worlds. But yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, Mike, I think I'd add 30 seconds of support. And of course, obviously, I'm a convert to the Church of SSI. What, what I've looked at, and I focus in healthcare. And so um, when, when I look more to the perfect use case, what I can say over the last two years that I've been involved in this, looking at it from a healthcare data standpoint, there are not only, as you point out, architectural efficiencies around a VC and things like OCA when it comes to moving healthcare data, of which both the VC and healthcare data are JSON objects. The second thing really does come down to some of these principles about SSI and zero knowledge proofs. And when you're dealing with either um, disenfranchised communities or, I, I mean, I'll put it face to face, what we're doing, you know, dealing with here in the U.S. where all of a sudden we're looking at an issue of healthcare privacy around reproductive rights that compares with any sort of model in a third world country where we're concerned about, excuse me, low and middle income countries, where we're concerned about preserving privacy in connection with uh, discrimination. Um, we've had a recent use case here where our HRV surveillance programs are having problems. Why? Because people are like, I don't understand what you're doing with your data and why are you telling me? Um, and and uh, again, architecturally, it's not perfect, but the, the Indy Aries concept and that decentralized approach to credentials offers solutions in that health equity world that the X509 PKD go out to a identity service provider model do not just by, from my observation. I'm reassured by your by your explanation there, Jim, because I, I, I'm trying to, listen, I'm, I'm a blockchain SSI fetishist, like, you know, bar none, I, I believe in the technology, but I, sometimes I have these little doubts. And when you tell me what you've just told me, then I kind of like, I'm, I'm sort of reassured thinking, yeah, okay, I'm on the right lines here because, you know, it, it, is, it is true, the, European Union did choose X509 PKI for their uh, green pass. A lot of other vaccine certificates, you know, uh, coronavirus vaccine passports and so on, were, were, did, didn't go to the blockchain. And they could have done, but they didn't. And I'm kind of thinking, well, we've got we've got to win this argument, if you like. It's all SSI. I mean, X509 PKI is still SSI, but a different flavor of SSI. And I'm kind of like, how do we how do we kind of overcome that 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 sort of conflict, if you want to call it that? So yeah, I, 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 very very good answer. Thank you, Jim. Just in the context of Switzerland, as said, we're still formulating the law. So what they found very important this time is the second time we're trying to have like an e-identity is uh, they are not going to specify which technology. They're going to specify the needs that they have. So security, uh, privacy, data protection, all these needs, and then see what solutions they, they are able to develop. And as said, in these uh, working uh, GitHub groups where the, the discussion is that it's highly likely it's going to start out as a PKI and then transition yeah. over to the, yeah. the blockchain. I've, I've also looked at, um, I've been working on uh, CBDCs as well, you know, uh, central bank digital currencies. They're, they're going through the same process. I've, I've read a lot of papers from, you know, uh, the ECB, the Federal Reserve, uh, Bank of England and so on. And they're looking at introducing exactly the same kind of ideas in terms of technology. It's not very far credential, it's not identity, but it's still, do we use blockchain or do we not? So this this ongoing discussion that we're having here is gonna is, is gonna take place again and again and again. It'd be very interesting, Marco, to see to see how that that conversation goes in Switzerland. Yeah, we're we're, we're excited too, yeah. Hope, hopefully by 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 next year we we, we know more. <laughs> And thank you for your for your demo as well, Marco. By the way, very good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Are there any more questions for Marco in the last few minutes of the call? All right. Well, Marco, thank you so much for this great presentation, uh, great video demos too. We really appreciate you joining us and giving your perspective as a designer. And thank you to everyone for joining, providing working group updates and your questions and thoughts in this uh, discussion at the end. So thank you all so much and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Sharp. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.